So, the last few classes, we worked out generalized Hooke's law, which is sort of the, the basis of hyperelasticity. We made some thermodynamic arguments, and we showed that, you know, from the fully generalized constitutive model all the way down to the isotropic case, uh, what it looks like. And, you know, typically the way we populate those type of constituent models is through a tensile test, right? So, uh, if you're not familiar with... If you're not familiar with the tensile test, we, we typically have a round sample, or sometimes we use a, a dog bone sample, so it looks like this. And we put it in a, in a load frame or a standard test apparatus and we pull on it. Right? And we measure with some kind of maybe extensiometer, we measure the change in length. Right? Sorry, was this a Brazilian test used in our uh, Right now, I'm, I'm specifically talking about metals. And a Brazilian test is actually not a material property test. I'm going to move into geomaterials. Because what we're doing here is we're going to set the stage for, uh, we, we have to learn a little bit of concepts that are easily, easier to explain with metals that then will add complexity to get to geomaterials, okay? But uh, a Brazilian test is actually not a material property test in the sense that you can't really produce a stress-strain curve from it because it's not a homogeneous stress state in the, in the, in the sample, right? So, you know, we go to the lab and we do these type of tests. We measure the change in length. Uh, we also, we, we measure the force. And from those, we can infer, you know, stress and strain curves using the sort of one-dimensional concepts that we introduced on day one. Okay. And if we were to look at, you know, the stress-strain curve produced from one of these tests, you know, we, we look at it in one dimension. We assume that this is a uniaxial stress, so the stress is uniform uh, along this dimension, okay? And it, we produce a curve, and the slope of that curve, basically, um, and if, you know, say, say we had a plate, we had a big, large plate, And from that plate, we cut many of these samples. And, but we cut them in different orientations. So if we cut them in many different orientations and we ran these tensile tests in all those directions, then we could basically measure all the constants that we need to populate that generalized Hooke's law or that elastic the, uh, you know, of course, if, if the measurements are all the same in any, in any way that we would cut these, then it's just an isotropic material, right? <clears throat> so, and you know, this is the Young's modulus, okay? So, <clears throat> the problem is, is that this linear region, for typically for metals, is somewhere only about maybe 2% of strain. Two, I'm sorry, not 0.2%. 0.02. 2%. Strain. So it's a very small it's a very, very small region of an overall response of the material. So if I continue to pull on this thing, eventually it becomes inelastic, or sometimes we use the word plastic, okay, and produces a response that, that might look like this, okay. <clears throat> and so this is pretty obvious. We've all, like, seen metals do this. You know, you can take a paper clip, right, and you can, you can bend it just a little bit and it goes back, and a little bit and it goes back. But eventually, if you bend it too much, then you, you permanently deform it, right? And so 
the recoverable deformation, the elastic deformation. So if I were to pull on this, not, not to the extent that it pulls in two pieces, but pull on it to some point and then release it, there is some small amount of elastic deformation that's recoverable. And so the strain will go back to here. Right? And if I were to then take the same sample and reload it, I would reload because the strain is permanent. Right? There's some permanent strain here. And if I were to reload up this, it would, it would reload back up this line, back to this point, even though this point may be higher than the place where it originally yielded. This is a, this is a so-called yield point. Okay. So if I take it past yield and I stop and I unload it, there'll be some permanent deformation. If I reload it again, it's going to reload up this path back up to this point, now the new yield point, which is higher than the old one, the material is actually strengthened or worked hardened, and it'll continue on this, on this path, right? And this is hypothetical. The, it's going to have some, you know, the, the actual path this takes can depend on a lot of things, and we'll talk about some of those mechanisms, okay? So, we've all seen this in metals, right? Uh, but this is in a geomechanics class. Ultimately, we want to talk about rocks. And again, we're going to ex explain some of these preliminary concepts in the context of metals because it's easier to understand, but we're going to add complexity. So, but just to get it right out of the way up front, who, think rocks, who, who thinks that rocks behave like this? So if, if I go to the lab and I create a cylindrical sample like this and I pull on it, that rock is going to, a, a rock will be, behave plastically like that? Or will it just break in half? Right. What's if you press? So, if, if I, so you're saying if I reverse the force, if I push on it instead of pull on it, what happens? It'll actually behave plastically like yeah. that? Yeah, so the, the, the answer is it's kind of a trick question. It, it depends. And typically, um, if I just pull or press on a rock that has, that's unconfined, meaning just sitting there in the, in the atmosphere, it's going to behave linear elastic until failure. In other words, it, it's just going to do this. You know, it's going to go up, and it's going to fail. Okay? But if I can find that sample in any way, Right? And so the way these tests are typically done is the sample is now placed inside a pressure vessel and it's confined radially with a hydrostatic confinement. So sigma 2, 2 equals sigma 3, 3 equals to sigma, some, some value, sigma h maybe. Okay, so if I confine it, and of course, a lot, most geomaterials are also porous, so we have to do these experiments very carefully such that the, that the fluid that we confine it with, it's usually water or some type of hydraulic fluid, it doesn't seep into or permeate the sample, right? So we, we, we typically protect these in a membrane, and then we place the sample in a pressure vessel. We confine it with some confining fluid, and we push on it, and now, the rock will respond very much like a metal in the sense that, I say very much, the, the actual physical mechanisms aren't the same that's causing it, but the characteristic of the curve is very similar. In other words, you'll see some linear elastic region, maybe some hardening, and typically some softening, but softening not, not abrupt failure, but softening up to some point, and then maybe later on, failure. Okay? So under confining pressure, rocks behave very much intuitively or characteristically like metals. Okay? And, of course, the rocks we're interested in are deep in the ground. They, of course, have confining pressure on them, right? The pressure of all the other rocks around them. Okay? So, the rock behavior can be very inelastic or plastic. And I'll use those words interchangeably. I think correctly, I should say inelastic, 
because plasticity is usually associated with slip across, across, along crystallographic planes and metals, and that's not the mechanism or always the mechanism that causes uh, causes this behavior in a, in a rock. I mean, it, it, it could be slick, slip across microcracks, but it can also be poor collapse and other things that cause that, that aren't traditionally associated with slip. So the, the, the actual correct term would be inelasticity or inelastic response, but I'll use it interchangeably with plastic, okay? And just so you, so I don't, I can show you something real and, and not just cartoons. Um, This is an actual. This is an actual test that was performed, uh, that I did, on two types of concrete. Now I know concrete is not a rock, but we characterize concrete as a geomaterial, right? Concrete soils and rocks we call geomaterials, and they behave characteristically very similar. And so, uh, this was a. This is a two types of concrete that that I tested, and. Um, you know, the way we plot the data is, is a little bit different than we do uh, in typical engineering analysis. So it's not, you, you notice on the left-hand side over here, it's not just stress, but it's principal stress difference. And that's because we're, we're loading it like this, right? So we have some sigma 1, and then we have sigma 2 equals sigma 3, right? And so what we're plotting there is sigma 1 minus sigma 2 or sigma 1, 1 minus sigma 2, 2, right? Or 3, 3, they're the same. So you can write it however. And if you remember <clears throat> from Moore circle, right, from Moore circle, we have sigma 1, sigma 2. This difference, right, is the same thing as 2, sigma 1, 2, or, you know, 2 times the shear stress, right? Uh, well, I'm sorry. This is equal to 2 times sigma 1, 2. This point is, let's, let's be precise, 2 times sigma max. Right? This is the maximum shear stress. So when you see a curve like this and you see the principal stress difference, you can think two times the maximum shear stress, right? So it's really a plot of like shear, shear stress versus axial strain, okay? And you can see the material. So this, is at, this, this test was performed at a 20 KSI confining pressure. And then I have another plot at 58 KSI confining pressure. So at higher confining pressure, you can see the material is much stronger, right? So I don't know if you, you paid enough attention. Look at the peak stress here, or you know, peak maximum shear stress is somewhere between 50 and 60 KSI. Whereas here it's you know 70 up to 85. So it's significantly stronger. Okay, and so now, if we want to have a constitutive model that can handle all this complex behavior, you have to you see we have we have to include a lot more complexity because now we have certainly in this case pressure dependence, right? So we have to have include terms, uh, and, I, and I'll come back to this point in just a second. But we have to include terms that include pressure dependence. Yeah. It's, it's so small you can barely see it. It's very, very small. It's, it's just right down here. Excuse me. Hmm. Is that under uh, compression? Yes. So, uh, 58 KSI confining pressure. This is not failure. This is actually the material is still intact and it's unloaded. So actually, if you want to get an estimated elastic modulus, you'd use this region right here, because it's going to unload elastically. And, and a lot of times, you'll actually see this in, um, in these type of tests. 
it's really hard to get a good, accurate uh, measure of the elastic modulus of a rock right at the initial loading. Uh, so what you'll see is unload reload cycles, and those are to determine the elastic module. So what you might see in an actual experiment a lot of times, uh, so we'll say two times tau versus axial strain, what you'll see is some curve like this, and then you'll see a little unload reload, and then maybe another one, right, until failure. And the purpose of that is to actually get the elastic modulus. Because, you know, right at the initial loading, you can have a, a lot of sort of, you know, little tiny micro slips along micro cracks and other kind of just other settling of the material right at the initial loading. And so it's, it's a little bit difficult to get a good, accurate elastic modulus there. So you'll typically see these unload reload cycles, okay? <clears throat> and so uh, I had another, though that was actually real data that I collected. I have some other sort of conceptual stuff. Uh, yeah. If we, if we continue uh, confining confine it though, the, it would be like negative slope line after the Let's take a look. Um, so this is, uh, this is actually data from limestone. OK? And in this case, the confining pressures are 100, 200, 400. So at very low, well, not, not very low, but at lower confining pressures, the material behaves basically very close to linear elastic brittle, right? So at 100 MPa, you load it up to there. These dots actually represent where the material failed, OK? So at 100 MPa, you load it to there, material fails. 200 MPa, you can load it a little higher, but it fails. 400 MPa, you load a little bit higher and it fails. Now you go to 600 MPa, all of a sudden the material you know, has this large softening phase, okay? You go to even higher confining pressure, now it behaves almost like a metal, right? It flows. Even higher, now it's starting to approach like what you'd expect from a rubber. Uh, it locks up, right? And this is, t this is typical. I mean, at very, very high confining pressures, it's very difficult to get the material to fail because Failure it typically uh, occurs along shear planes and, and secondary tensile stresses that that, come, that that propagate when an initial microflaw or initial crack nucleates. And in very high confining pressures, it's hard to get that to happen. So, you know, very, very high confining pressures, you can get the material to basically just, the more you strain it, the, the stronger it gets. Well, I didn't create this chart, so I, I'm assuming that it's the right unit. Yeah. Confining pressure? I think that's achievable. KSI. Right. So, I mean, I, I can't vouch for the, the, the accuracy of the figure. I took it from a book, but I'm assuming it's right. But these pressures are, are achievable. They're probably not what you're used to, but, you know, when I was at Sandia, uh, where we did penetration mechanics, so in penetration mechanics, you're talking about weapons effects or impact on rocks. And the pressures generated right around the impact region are very, very high. And so in order to get the proper material properties so that we could do computations, we had to do experiments at these types of confining pressures. Very, very high. Uh, regularly up to 30 GPA. Yeah, so high, way high. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is just another figure uh, dealing with some soils, but you can see some similar inelastic behavior from soils. <clears throat> 